Hello. Um, welcome to a talk about a handout. Uh, I call it some of the big guys and some of their big ideas. And <coughs> this is a handout that I give not only to my introductory philosophy course, but also to my deductive logic course students. Um, and I do this for two reasons. One is for organization. Um, I think back when I was a student, it wasn't that many years ago, and my professors were always throwing out names. It was kind of overwhelming. So one of the things I've done with this handout is to um, uh, give you a, a chronological listing, basically, of names from the Greeks, as we'll see, the ancients, through the medievals, through the early moderns, and uh, to the moderns. And at least it, that will allow you, I think, some kind of framework in which to hang what would otherwise be just completely an overwhelming torrent <coughs> excuse me, of philosophers' names. And the other, the other reason I do this is that I think every philosophy class should be a class about ideas. Now, with the introductory class, that's not hard to do. Logic can sometimes be taught as a purely technical subject, and it seems to me that, that that's a mistake. Uh, logic is about ideas, too, and logic is about philosophy, and one cannot do philosophy without some understanding at least of the history of philosophy. So I give this uh, to both classes and in both classes I, um, I promise that there will be on the uh, final exam a five-point bonus question. Now it's not a term paper, it's not a major assignment, it's only five bonus points, but then it is five free points basically in which what you'll need to do from the handout is take uh, a philosopher, name a philosopher, name the idea associated with that philosopher, and describe that idea in a sentence, or perhaps two, for one, one, and three points, total of five. Okay, um, first of all, the timeline. The timeline runs, and by the way, I just, I should say this, this is, is to accompany the download of the uh, of the ha actual handout itself, which is a Dropbox. And I gave you that reference in the early lectures in each of the two classes, intro and, uh, and logic. Uh, the ancients, the Greeks from the early sixth century, uh, from the sixth century before the common era, uh, the medievals, uh, the early moderns and the moderns. And these are pretty much standard uh, historical periodizations. But why say Greeks with respect to the ancients? What about the Romans? Well, um, the Romans did contribute uh, a little bit of philosophy, but uh, and they respected philosophy, but they didn't really do a lot of, of original work. Now, the Romans did some other things. They built a formidable civilization. By the time Marcus Aurelius died in Wundabona in the year 180 of the Common Era, a quarter of the world's population was under Roman domination. This, by the way, if you've seen the film Gladiator, this depicts uh, the Emperor Marcus Aurelius just before his death. Windebonum is the, what we now call Vienna. It was the furthest uh, to which the furthest extent to which the Roman Empire had reached into Germania, uh, Germany. Um, in addition to military might, the Romans were engineers and architects. Uh, Hadrian's Wall, you could still walk it. The Pont du Gau in the south of France, I have walked that as both a bridge and an aqueduct. My wife trembling at the bottom, waiting for me to fall. The Appian Way can still take traffic. You wouldn't want to drive over it, but, uh, but still, it's, it's a, an existing roadway. The Romans even bridged the Rhine, but they did this with the wooden bridge because they were in a hurry, and that doesn't survive. That was quite a feat of engineering. The Romans also produced orators and statesmen, Seneca, Cicero, etc. Uh, when they wanted their children to learn Greek, to learn philosophy, however, they either hired or enslaved Greeks uh, to do that. The chief exception is Stoicism, um, and it's uh, it's a, a viewpoint that was very odd in ancient times. Something that's come into its own in uh, modern centuries. The two major spokesmen for Stoicism, Marcus Aurelius, I mentioned, and Epictetus. Marcus Aurelius was the emperor, Epictetus was a slave. And this is characteristic one from the highest end of society, the other from the lowest end of society. But the basic point of view of Stoicism is we all put our trousers on one leg at a time. Anybody put their trousers on differently? Hmm. Um, that is, human beings, as human beings, have certain key things in common independently of their places in the social pecking order. And again, this was very much at odds with, with ancient societies of all sorts. 
uh, it's something that's coming to its own now, for example, with the notion of human rights, that it doesn't matter what passport you carry, uh, that there are still certain things you cannot do to another human being just by virtue of their having the dignity of being a human being. So whether we look to the Declaration of the Rights of Man from the time of the French Revolution or Kant's proposal for a League of Nations, uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights after the Second World War, um, this uh, Stoic contribution becomes rather important. Um, Carmine Anthe Appia uh, has an interesting book on this recent book, uh, Cosmopolitanism, I give that one a look. Um, the legacy of the medieval period, religion and philosophy. Yes, it's a cliche that the Middle Ages was an age of religion, um, or an age of religion, I guess. Um, but cliches are not necessarily false just for being cliched. It's true enough as it goes. Um, I always find it interesting when two things happen. I find it interesting when religion rejects philosophy, as often it does, and also when religion uses philosophy, as often it does. The Christian church father, Tertullian, asked the following question. What hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? What hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? And his answer was nothing. Is he asking a geography question? No. Um, Jerusalem, uh, the city of faith, built on seven hills like Rome. Um, it was a religious center for a long time. Of course, it's the home to not one, but three major world religions, uh, Judaism, religion 1.0, 1 religion 1 Christianity, religion 2.0, and Islam, religion 3.0. And in turn, um, this cultic site was built on um, sites so sacred to the early Philistines, Palestinians of the day. Um, why hills? Well, if you worship a sky god, and you want to sacrifice to him, you go to the highest place you can find. You know, uh, Abraham takes Isaac to a mountain. Um, the higher you get, the, cl to, to the closer to the sky you get. That's where the sky gods live. They can smell your sacrifices better. That's why hills are important religiously. Um, and so not, not one, but uh, three religions uh, hold Jerusalem sacred. It's the city of faith. Athens, the city of Socrates, not only Socrates, but Plato and Aristotle, those three great generations. The, the city to which, although philosophy began in the provinces in Ionia and in Magna Grecia, it migrates to Athens about the time of Socrates and stays there for some centuries afterwards. So Athens is the city of philosophy or the city of secular reason, perhaps. Uh, and so, so th that's the point of uh, Tertullian's question, isn't it? What hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? What hath reason to do with faith? And his answer to that was that they have nothing to do with one another. Uh, you can read this when you get the PDF if you want the details. Um, so religion can reject philosophy as Tertullian does. Um, if philosoph philosophy doubts and faith believes, how could the two ever combine or cooperate? Faith and doubt make for poor roommates. Hmm. Jerry Falwell, Christians, like slaves and soldiers, ask no questions. Hey, Jerry, can you hear me down there? Okay, just, just, just checking. Um, but there are plenty of religious people who say, you know, have faith and just believe. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you want to see something, you are not faithful. Uh, and some religious believers are perfectly happy to say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, QED, end of story. Problem with this is, religious believers usually want not only to believe, they want to believe in something, and they want to believe that that something is true. So how do you get from belief to truth? You know, Macy's has National Believe Day. You know, they put this on the outside of the building. Um... Eisenhower famously said, our government makes no sense unless it is founded on a deeply held religious belief that I don't care what it is. Daniel Dennett, uh, most people in the West who say they believe in God actually believe in belief in God. But this is kind of paradoxical. How can you have faith in faith? How can you have belief in belief? Isn't belief transitive? Doesn't it have to have an object? Don't you have to believe in something? How can you have just belief it's sort of like the, the paradox, the Zen tradition holds. We, we could be thinking without thinking thoughts, but isn't thinking transitive? How can you have pure thought without having an object 
of your thought, of course, the Zen tradition wants to insist that we should free ourselves from all objects. But is that even, is that, does it even make sense? What is belief in general, absent content? What is belief without an object of belief? Religious believers usually want to believe certain things which they think are true, and they want to disbelieve in other things which they think are false. So, you know, Macy's advice, uh, believe the generic advice and motivational posters, not specifically useful to religious believers and may even positively be irreligious. So one response on the part of religion is that it can reject philosophy. Another response is that religion can use philosophy for its own ends. Uh, if Tertullian is an example of the first, uh, Abelard is an example of the second. By doubting, we come to inquire, he said, and by inquiry, we pursue truth. So faith and doubt, not necessarily opposed. You know, If you doubt, you can come to a resolution of those doubts, and therefore you can come to a correct opinion. Abelard and Heloise, if you don't know the story, um, or famously fell in love. Uh, her uncle uh, got his bully boys to castrate Abelard, so that kind of took care of that love affair. She went into a nunnery, and, but they remained friends uh, their entire life. It's kind of a classic love story. Um, and then, uh, by way of contrast with Tertullian, again, this and Thomas Aquinas, Doctor Angelicus, and uh, eventual, the, eventually the official philosopher of the uh, Roman Catholic Church, and by the way, saint. Thomas Aquinas. And, and, and looking at this handout, by the way, notice whenever you see saint in front of the philosopher's name, it doesn't happen often, but whenever you do, probably you got a medieval philosopher. Now, Tertullian thought that reason and religion, philosophy, and theology didn't overlap at all. The Latin Averroists held that there were truths of religion that differ from the truths of philosophy, what we now call, uh, well, according to Stephen Jay Gould, non-overlapping magisterial authority, NOMA. Uh, religion is one thing, uh, reason is another, and the twain should meet. St. Thomas didn't go that route. Um, he opposed the Averroist uh, solution and, and saw a, at least some area of overlap between philosophy and theology. Theology can be either revealed, in which case it's outside the scope purely of reason, but it can also be natural. And um, he embraced, for example, uh, that natural argument for the existence of God, as others have subsequently. So like Abelard, St. Thomas welcomed philosophy as an adjunct to faith. Uh, this is an interesting um, uh, painting. It hangs in the Louvre. There are similar paintings from the same period. Um, and uh, it shows St. Thomas enthroned uh, in the center, and he's got his posse, those two Greek guys, Aristotle and Plato. They're assisting him, and at his feet is Averroes. Who was Averroes? Well, that was his Latinized name. Uh, his actual name was Ivarushd. Uh, he was a Muslim, and uh, it was from Averroes, known as the commentator. Aristotle was known as the philosopher, Averroes, the commentator. It was from the commentator that St. Thomas and the Western uh, scholastics in, the, in our Middle Ages <coughs> got back the writings of Aristotle and made much of that. Uh, so this iconography um, is, is meant to depict that, that, yeah, uh, philosophy, even the philosophy of secular people, pagans, uh, even those in the wrong religion, Islam, hmm, uh, you may have a part to play. Uh, we can cooperate. And in Europe, uh, it's not uncommon to study philosophy in high school. Um, two of the major 20th century philosophers, Popper and Jean-Paul Sartre, in fact, taught high school philosophy when they were starting out. Wittgenstein taught uh, elementary school. Uh, Hegel spent 14 years teaching high school. And this is as a result of the legacy of, of uh, education in the Catholic tradition. Um, if you're one of those few Americans who may have studied philosophy in high school, chances are you studied at a parochial school. Um, you won't tend to find that situation in public schools in this country, although in, in Europe it's much more widespread. But the, this is a consequence of Aquinas and the Roman Catholic Church embracing philosophy so long ago. So it's challenging to generalize about religion and reason. One should think very carefully before ever finishing a sentence, the subject of which is religion, capital R, singular, because almost all propositions that begin that way are going to be false. It would be mistaken to think that the relation is always hostile. Sometimes it's hostile, sometimes it's friendly. So there's a the kind of way of looking at this, there are the History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom, or lately, you know, Bill Maher's film, Religious, 
um, which suggests that um, it's always a hostile relationship, but it's not. So, so sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Let's look at religious pluralism. Uh, that's a basic precondition for religion wanting to use philosophy, I think, in the first place. What is it? Well, religious pluralism refers to a condition in which there's more than one religion within the bounds uh, of any given society or territory, or at least at its edges. The contrast would be religious monopoly. Under monopoly, there is only one religion, at least there's only one religion de jure. Primitive societies are characterized by monopoly. There may be little outside cultural contact, little intercultural uh, exchange. So, you know, to be a member of your society is to hold the religion of your society, which is not to say that there may not be village atheists uh, in the uh, in primitive societies too, but they're just not Methodists. In more complex societies, there may be a virtual religious monopoly. Catholic Church in the Middle Ages is kind of the classic example of that, but hold that thought. Because even in a situation of, of de jure monopoly, the boundaries were not entirely impermeable. On the whole, the medieval church enforced its monopoly, punished dissent as heresy. So, for example, the Cathars, uh, a major religious group in the south of France and in the north of Spain, um, the Pyrenees, uh, that area, uh, were slaughtered. Uh, Simon de Montfort famously um, slaughtered them all. God will know his own. Kill them all. God will sort them out. There were people burned at the stake. Um, in addition to wiping out the Cathars, uh, heretics were burned. Mild dissenters were excommunicated, sometimes killed. Um, the total monopoly of the Roman Catholic Church, of course, was ended by the Protestant Reformation. Now there are competing rulers who are going to protect competing theologies. Uh, and so Martin Luther um, may get his rejection that is from the church, but but he's got his prince to protect him. And so you begin to get um, a, a kind of a, a truce, not, well, the, the wars of religion went on, but, but at least a, a, a mixture uh, of Catholic monopoly in the center of Europe, uh, Protestant monopoly towards the north, and then the Muslims for the longest time um, eventually pushed into Granada, but for a long time you know, controlled a great deal of Spain. During and after the Protestant Reformation, Monopoly religions still had to contend with minority religions within the borders. So the accused of Catholics uh, in, in Britain, there was the, there were the Irish who remained Catholic uh, just across the waters. Uh, there was uh, Geneva with John Calvin, and uh, there were the Huguenots, Huguenots in um, Catholic France, uh, for example. Thus, for a long time, even in countries with a monopoly de jure, pluralism de facto was taking hold. Today, England's a good example of a monopoly which has come to incorporate and tolerate religious pluralism. Um, the Church of England is the official church. Uh, the monarch must be a member of the church. That's uh, part of the reason why uh, uh, the abdication you know, in, in the, just before the post-war period, George V the, 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 uh, gave way to George VI. Um, and uh, there's still a distinction between the church and chapel, chapel to everybody else, you know, whether it be the Methodists or Jews or Hindus or Muslims or what have you. Um, the monarch is still defender of the faith, at least uh, officially. Um, the church is dominant, uh, however other faiths are, are tolerated both socially and legally. Um, I ask my students when we have a group present here, um, when, when you were asked uh, in your application to uh, college, what your religion was, what did you say? And some people draw a blank and some people actually state their religion. Well, it's a trick question. We do not in this country, cannot in this country ask that. Uh, certainly not as a condition for admission to college, much less can we ask that question officially anyway. But you know, there was a time not too long ago, which if you did not belong to the Church of England, you did not get into university. The 39 articles of the church, you had to subscribe to those, uh, and if you couldn't, then you didn't get to Oxford, couldn't get to Cambridge, any of those colleges. Um, this is one of the reasons why the red bricks are founded, why Catholic schools are founded uh, in the 19th century. Eventually, the rule was relaxed. Now anybody can get in, uh, but uh, but for the longest time, that was a requirement. And even today, you know, you go into hospital, they'll ask who your religion. I have a friend from England, and um, he went in hospital and. Uh, uh, they asked what is religion, and he says, I have no religion. 
they looked on the form, the mission form later, and so they put down Church of England. Um, my friend Alistair McIntyre said that it is the creed of the English that there is no God and it is wise to pray to him from time to time. Um, well, but uh, it's uh, uh, still an official religion to what extent uh, people are required to believe in it, to what extent bishops even are required to believe in God and that sort of thing is, uh, is an open question. The United States, on the other hand, the quintessential example of religious pluralism. Um, not only are there many religions uh, in the United States, there is no established religion to uh, exercise a monopoly. What did Voltaire say? If you have two religions in your land, the two will cut each other's throats. But if you have 30 religions, they'll dwell in peace. Something to that. Pluralism, however, is not the entire story of religion in America. You know, uh, the Puritan colonies were founded by people who wanted religious freedom. They founded New England because Old England, uh, the, the church, the official church would not tolerate uh, their dissent. Uh, so promptly they began to hang Quakers and Baptists once they got power. Um, they were previously persecuted, but they established their own persecution. Today that's gone. Uh, the religious, the United States uh, not only has religious pluralism, it lacks any established religion, Puritan or otherwise. There's the famous separation of church and state, the wall of separation of church and state. Um, but religious pluralism is actually more common historically than many people imagine. It can coexist with the establishment of a dominant religion. Indeed, even under the Catholic monopoly, uh, the boundaries were permeable. So the church confronted Jews, but also confronted, and this is interesting, Muslims during the height of the you know, supposed Catholic monopoly, um, particularly in Spain, but not limited to Spain, Sicily, other places as well. What happens when plural religious claims confront each other? Well, let's take person A. He says, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, there are three persons, one God. Okay, person B comes along and says, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Now, both of these people believe, but again, belief is transitive. It has an object. Uh, neither A nor B, I think, would like us just to believe. A insists that we believe in the Trinity, but not in Allah. Uh, B insists that we believe in Allah, but not in the Trinity. You know, the, the Muslims and the Jews have this bone to pick with the Christians. Look, you know, we're monotheists, Muslims and Jews, that's clear. You Christians claim to be monotheists, but you've really got three persons. What is it? Three is not equal to one. You choose. You got three gods, you got one god. Um, so there will be some naturally some contention there. Now here are the possibilities. What A says may be true, and what B says may be false. What A says may be false, and what B says may be true, or what A says may be false, and what B says may be false. It's not possible logically what A says is true and what B says is true if they contradict themselves. So, so there is implicitly a choice to be made. How do you make this choice? How do you settle such a controversy? Um, well, you can kill your opponent or you can talk to your opponent. Um, the fact of religious pluralism is what makes talking, particularly reasoning about religion, more attractive to religious thought than otherwise it might be. You know, if everybody shares the same creed, then all the clergy needs to do is preach. Or there are plural religions, though, you know, then you need to think about some reasons why my belief might be better than the other guy's belief. Um, you can't just preach to the choir. So you might seek some natural grounds, you know, natural theology, that sort of thing, common ground uh, between people whose beliefs otherwise differ. Now, the modern age is one of religious pluralism by and large, but so too is the age of faith in certain pockets. There were crusades against Islam. Jews were persecuted as well. Uh, but there's an interesting book here by, by Chris Lowney, uh, ex-Jesuit, um, A Vanished World, uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews in Medieval Spain. And it was a, it was a contentious uh, relationship, but uh, there were lots of interchanges. Um, they did, for times, coexist peaceably. For the longest time, Spain was the land of three religions. If you go to Cordoba, um, the Mesquita was first a mosque, then a cathedral. Here it is. I was there uh, just uh, last summer. And it looks like this forest of, of, of columns, um, which uh, marks the old mosque. It used to be open air. Now it's closed in. And when the Christians took over, they put a cathedral 
bit right in the center of this whole building. So it's, you know, it's, it's both an uh, ex-mosque and a cathedral. Um, during the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church held an established monopoly de jure, but there was at the same time a certain amount of religious pluralism de facto. The fact that we're dealing with religious pluralism and coexistence runs counter to, to our received stereotype these days. We tend to think of, you know, uh, Samuel Huntington, the clash of civilizations, uh, Muslim jihad, civilizational wars, et cetera, et cetera. But in the Middle Ages, certain pockets, religious pluralism was a fact of life, just as today there is uh, pluralism in the form of separation of church and state in many places. Now, the fact of religious pluralism is why you find St. Thomas arguing in the following way. Thus, he says, against the Jews, we're able to argue by means of the Old Testament, while against the heretics, that is, Christians who believe the wrong thing, we're able to argue by means of the New Testament. But the Muslims and the pagans accept neither the one nor the other. We must therefore have recourse to the natural reason to which all men are forced to give their assent. We see where this is going. In fact, even where religious pluralism was not as pronounced as it was in medieval times or in modern secular society, religions might still wish to cultivate knowledge, uh, if only for the edification of the believers. Um, those who can't read also can't read the Bible. Hmm? The first public school law in America, Ye Old Deluder Satan Act, uh, was meant to make sure that good Puritans were literate so they could read their scriptures uh, because ignorance was ungodly. There's a whole history of anti-intellectualism in American life, an interesting book by this title, Richard Hofstadter, classic, modern classic. Um, but there, there, religion has played a role in that, but also uh, the earliest colleges in America were founded by religious guys, uh, whether it be Yale or Harvard or, or the Log College, uh, we now call it Princeton. Um, and um, it was more important to have a learned laity than a converted laity for some of these folks. So here too, as with the church fathers like Tertullian and Abelard and Aquinas, the question of whether knowledge and learning are good for religion is a variable, not a constant for religious believers. By the way, footnote here uh, to St. Thomas. Uh, he was technically wrong about the Muslims. They do accept the Jewish and Christian scriptures and prophets. In fact, um, interesting fact, Mary is mentioned more in Quran than she is in the New Testament. And here is a minaret. Uh, it's kind of hard to get to now. It's in Afghanistan. But uh, 12th century minaret uh, and the, the uh, turquoise text around the outside is all about Mary. Um, so, you know, there was... Uh, the, 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 there was a different relationship perhaps than many people today imagine between Islam and Christianity over the centuries. Okay, religion and reason, arguing for God's existence. Yes, that can be attempted. Um, one of the key building blocks in this comes from Aristotle, uh, who talked about cause and effect. Every cause has an effect, every effect has a cause. So X causes Y, Y causes Z, etc. Um, well, so what caused X? W caused X. What caused W? V. How far back can you take this uh, regress? Um, well, two possibilities. It might be infinite or it might have a finite beginning. Aristotle rejects the infinity option, um, claims there must be some first cause, some prime mover, some uncaused cause of all causes that causes all the other causes. Now, Aristotle did not himself call this God, but you can imagine Lots of religious believers, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, um, oh, Anglicans too, I guess, um, have been happy to do this over the years. What does St. Thomas say? The existence, existence of a prime mover. Nothing can move itself. There must be a first mover. The first mover is called God. Hmm. Okay, here's an argument for the existence of God. It comes to us from St. Anselm. Um, and if you, you look at your handout, where will you find St. Anselm? Well, let's see. Oh, my page is there. <laughs> um, boom. Let's see. Page. Oops. Hmm. By the way, the, the, I think I mentioned there, there's a PDF version of this available in the Dropbox that I gave you that, that link uh, in the earlier lecture. Uh, yeah, so now it's on page four. And guess what? Uh, he's under the medievals. Um, 
as, as being saint he probably uh, would be. Um, okay, Anselm says, I can prove to you that God exists. Well, that's a pretty tall order. How would you do that? Well, we start with the definition. God, says in Anselm, is that being greater than which nothing can be conceived. God is that being greater than which nothing can be conceived. Now, is that a good definition of God? If you agree that it is, he says, follow this out. Anything which exists is greater than anything which does not exist. For example, I have in my head the idea of uh, the perfect ice cream cone. And it's a great, it has all the flavors I like, and it's, you know, I like the cone and everything. But still, that's not as good as the actual ice cream cone that I can get if I walk downstairs to my refrigerator, freezer, and uh, make it. So anything which exists is greater than anything which doesn't exist. Even the perfect idea, so the idea of a perfect ice cream cone, as long as it's just an idea and it doesn't exist as an actual ice cream cone, not nearly as good as the actual ice cream cone. Okay. Okay, suppose you say, okay, Anselm, I agree with you that God is that being greater than which nothing could be conceived, but by the way, that being doesn't exist. What have you just done? You've contradicted yourself in the same way that if you said, yeah, I believe in circles, but circles are square. No, that's, that's nonsense. If you say God is that being greater than which nothing can be conceived, he doesn't exist. Well, such a being which did exist would have to be greater than the idea of such a being which didn't exist. Therefore, by definition, QED, God exists. Hmm? This is what's called the ontological argument for the existence of God as formulated uh, by St. Anselm. Hmm. So Anselm takes a definition, just a linguistic thing, and from that he spins an existence claim. He says, hmm, okay, if I just think about the idea of God, then I'm going to draw some necessary conclusions which are true, which must, which are true because they must be true, and which are true of that being's existence. If I just sit in my armchair and think about God, the God who only exists in my head is less perfect than the one who actually exists out there, outside of me, outside of everything, and therefore that being has to exist. Hmm? God is the being that only need only be possible to be actual, who therefore is actual because he is possible. Now, clever argument, but does it work? Well, if you don't learn anything else from philosophy class, you don't take anything else away. One thing you should take away is that philosophers are a disagreeable lot. Think very carefully before ever finishing a sentence, the subject of which is all philosophers believe fill in the blank, because that proposition is almost surely going to be false. Every time you find a philosopher who says A, you're going to find another philosopher who says not A. And on and on and on. So did St. Anselm get pushed back? Of course he did. First was, first uh, major photo was a monk by the name of Gonil. He said, look, Anselm, suppose I have the idea of a perfect island. Now, of course, he was a monk, so he wouldn't have had this idea of an island. My perfect idea of an island is girls gone wild, you know, tropic sun, white sand beaches, Margaritaville, all that kind of stuff. Does that mean that my perfect island must exist? No, your argument is stupid. And as you can imagine, philosophers are disagreeable. lot. Anselm's going to come back and no, 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 no. I'm not saying that the perfect idea of anything must exist. I'm just saying that there's something peculiar about the idea of God whereby we can figure out that that being, if we can even conceive of that being greater, which nothing can be conceived, that being alone must exist as the necessary property of existence. Now, another angle of attack that philosophers have taken against uh, Anselm's kind of argument is this notion of properties. Um, God has the property of being an existing object. Okay. Philosophers like to use chairs, for example. I don't know why we do. Um, the chair has certain properties here. Okay, this chair happens to have a color, it's blue, happens to have a covering, it's fabric, might not have a covering, happens to have arms, this one does, not all of them do, it's not necessary to being a chair, but these are just properties of this chair. Uh, happens to have legs, four short wooden legs, again, doesn't have to be the case. We can say this chair exists, but is that a property in the same way that color is a property? Immanuel Kant famously said no. Um, 
suppose I go to buy a car and the salesman tells me, our cars are all mechanically sound, come with a six month written guarantee and exist. Does telling me that they exist actually add anything to the description? Is it the same kind of thing as telling me that, you know, it has four tires and a guarantee and what have you? Khan says, no, that's a, that's a category mistake. You're mixing apples and oranges here. So the, so the argument doesn't work. Okay, so, but you know, isn't it interesting that one can come up with a clever argument like this? And I think, you know, you have to give Anselm points for cleverness. Uh, this is true of a lot of philosophers. Uh, when we talk about Descartes, uh, that's also true of him. Even though nobody believes the conclusion that they come to, um, and, and many people, including Kant, for example, um, think the, the, the argument's a bad one, uh, whether or not he actually agrees with the conclusions doesn't matter. But still, you know, um, isn't it clever to sit down and say, you know, I could sit in my armchair and spin a definition, and from that definition, I could get this sort of big claim uh, deductively whether I can justify it or not is another matter. So, leads me to a question, true-false question. True or false? All philosophers are atheists. All philosophers are atheists. Well, you may have imagined from what I said a little earlier what that answer is going to be, and that's going to be false. In fact, some philosophers are not atheists. Uh, some are theists, some are deists, some are polytheists, some are pantheists, some are agnostics, all these things mean different state. But, but think very carefully before ever completing a sentence, the subject of which is all philosophers believe blank, fill in the blank, um, because it's almost always going to be true. Um, so here we have, you know, St. Anselm. Uh, he's a saint and also Archbishop, Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, he clearly does. When we read Socrates, one of the ironic things about Socrates is, oh, spoiler alert, he's put on trial for his life one of the charges uh, brought to, to bar for, uh, before the bar is um, that he doesn't believe in the gods. And he kind of dismisses that out of hand. It's pretty clear to anybody who knows him that he not only believes in a lot of the gods, Greeks had a lot of gods, but he, only, he even has his own personal god. So you can find examples of philosophers. Uh, it all takes, by the way, is one example, but you find a number of examples of philosophers who believe in God or the gods in various ways. And I won't go over this, but if you want to, Look at the, the, the PDF later of the handout, uh, handout of, of the PowerPoint here. Um, there are some definitions. In general, religious belief turns out to be much more complicated than most people imagine. And this also includes religious believers themselves. I have a question for you. Why did the Romans feed the Christians to the lions? And the answer is because the Christians were atheists. What? But, but, but. Nowadays, you know, if there's anything to be said about atheism, it's usually a battle between orthodox religious believers, Christians included, and people who call themselves atheists. How is it that the Christians could be atheists? Well, as my friend Alistair McIntyre points out, the first theist is also necessarily the first atheist. As if you come into a situation of plural gods and you want to say, on the contrary, there's one and only one God, well, you got to demolish all the other gods. You got to be an atheist about a lot of gods. Think about what it must have looked like from the standpoint of Mount Olympus. Well, it's called monotheism, says Mercury to Zeus, but it looks like downsizing to me. If you've seen Mel Brooks's uh, film, the, uh, the History of the World, uh, he has a he has a, a scene in which uh, he plays the Roman. Uh, stand-up comedian Comicus, and he tells this joke about the Christians. Have you all heard about this new sect, the Christians? They are a laugh riot. First of all, they are so poor. How poor are they? Thank you. They are so poor that they have only one God. <laughs> only one God. Yeah, as a piece of contemporary atheist propaganda says, we're all atheists about most gods. Some of us just go one God further. Um, Christians and Jews don't believe in Allah. They don't believe in Augustus as divine. They don't believe in Zeus. Atheists just go further because they add Yahweh or Allah uh, to, this, to, to these lists. Um, religion and reason. Well, you could argue for God's existence. You could also argue against God's existence. And again, what I said before, think very carefully before finish, finishing a sentence, the subject of which uh, is all philosophers believe, fill in the blank. 
Okay, so yeah, there are some philosophers who will argue for the existence of God, and I think that's interesting. You know, it's not obvious. Um, it's not obvious that any such argument would work. Some people like to tell you and think that it's even pointless to do that, but there are some people who do that. And there are philosophers who argue against God, too. Let's look at Jean-Paul Sartre. And Jean-Paul Sartre, where would you find him in the handout? Is he ancient, medieval, early modern, modern? You find him on page 14, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. So, you know, I don't, you know, let's see, 1905 to 1980. So he died within sort of my lifetime and maybe some of your lifetimes as well. Fairly recent, 20th century philosopher. Okay, now Sartre is not a theologian. Saint Anselm is being a saint and bishop, very interested in God. Sartre's not, but he has an analysis of being, which as a side consequence has some definite things to say about God and religion. And here's how his argument goes. There are two kinds of being. There's what we can call et en soi, and there's what we can call et pour soi. In English, there's being in itself, and there's being for itself. Now, what's the difference? Well, being in itself, it is what it is. It is not what it is not. It does not make itself. It was caused in the past, whereas being for itself is different in all four particulars, because it is not what it is, and it is what it is not. It makes itself, it is a project to itself. And the causal relationship is reversed because for being for itself, it's the future that causes the present, not the, not the past. That all sounds very abstract. What does it mean? Well, let's take a concrete example. I'm sitting on a chair, you probably are also. Take a look at your chair. Okay, it is what it is, the chair. It is not what it is not, it's not a table. It's not a Ford Mustang. Uh, it does not make itself. It, came out of a factory at some point, and it did so at some point in the past. Somebody in the past labored on the raw materials. I don't know what your chair is. Mine's wooden. Yours could be a combination of wood, metal, any other plastic, or whatever. Um, could be an armchair. I don't know. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, uh, tables and chairs and Ford Mustangs. Uh, these are all examples of beings in themselves, being in itself. And most things which are, are this way. Okay, well, then what's an example of being for itself? You. Um, you are not what you are. You are in the process of becoming. You are what you're not. You're projecting yourself into the future, and by doing that, you're causing the present to come about. You're causing that future to be realized starting in the present. Let me guess. Probably you're not still listening to me because you like to hear the sound of my voice as much as I like to hear the sound of my voice. But probably you're looking at yourself and saying, okay, I'm studying philosophy because I want an education. I want to be a different person in five years. Maybe I want to get a degree. Maybe I want to get an education. Maybe I want to get both. Maybe I want to get a new job. Maybe I want to change spouses. And, and what I'm doing here, reading philosophy, is part of a larger game plan to get me to be a different person. Okay. You're a project. You're projecting yourself into the future. Um, and you're making yourself, you're making that future by making yourself in the present. You're making a different future than would have happened had you not done that, for example. But that's an example of being for itself. Human beings are being beings for themselves, being for itself. Now, anything which is, is in one or other of these categories, but not both. But classically, God would have to be a being who is both. Since I, South, have just shown by my ontology that this is impossible, therefore, not only does God not exist, God does not exist because he cannot exist. God is an impossible being, QED. So, again, this isn't Scott's primary aim, but it's a side consequence of what his primary aim is, that is to give a, a general comprehensive account of what it is to be. Um, so, whereas St. Anselm says, not only does God exist, God exists because he has to exist, his existence is necessary. Jim Paul Sartre says, no, God does not exist, and the reason God does not exist is that God cannot exist, it is impossible for this to be. Now, further couple twists on this that Sartre gives that, that are interesting. Um, man is the desire to be God. We don't like the fact that we are being in itself radically free 
because it forces us to choose and it makes us nervous and uncomfortable. So we try to pretend that we're actually as stable and solid, for example, as a chair. So has this famous analysis of the, of the waiter in being nothing as a waiter who may think that he is actually just a waiter, but you can see by the way he acts, he's pretending, he's playing at being a waiter, he's playing a role. There's some distance from his role. He, he is something that is not completely embodied in the, the facticity of what he seems to be portraying. Man is the desire to be God. We don't like our freedom, so we try to escape it by pretending that we're uh, as solid as a chair when we're just simply evanescent. Um, and this uh, is, 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 is a characteristic tendency of the human animal. It's also futile and bound to fail. It is what Sartre calls bad faith. According to Sartre, we are free. We're radically free. We are free to do everything except to be unfree. So man is condemned to be free. He says famously, so it's good at oh, one-liners like this. Man is condemned to be free. Our freedom is a condemnation. We we're not free to be unfree. We're free to do anything else. Again, we dislike this. We're always seeking excuses. You know, the devil made me do it. I had toxic parents. I was born in a bad neighborhood. I got dealt that bad hand of cards. Sartre says bullshit. Um, some people think of Sartre as an immoralist because he, he was famously, famously would claim that there, there is no moral obligation that binds you necessarily. But you can also see Sartre as the moral drill sergeant of the modern world. Quit your bitch and suck it up. Nobody gets you out of bed in the morning and puts a gun to your head. Uh, you decide to get yourself up. As his friend Camus said famously, suicide is the really, only the really important philosophical question. You can always end your life, but insofar as you choose not to do that, then you do choose the circumstances under which you then continue to make your life, even if you didn't choose those circumstances, perhaps in a second order way. St. Anselm seems primarily interested in arguing for God's existence while well, he was a churchman. Sat is not primarily interested in that. It's just as a side consequence that he gets his argument. But again, they, they seem to be parallel. Um, St. Anselm says God exists, and the reason is that he must exist. Given what the very idea of God contains, this being cannot not exist. And Sat says God does not exist because he cannot. He's an impossible idea. And I've noticed a couple things here. First of all, when St. Anselm starts his argument, it is an argument. He's not preaching. He doesn't care what you believe. He's not saying, if you first believe in God, that I can convince you that God exists by some arguments. No, 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 no. So I don't care what you believe. I don't care if you believe there's a God, if you believe there's no God, if you say you're an agnostic and I don't know one way or another. If you listen to what I, St. Anselm, say to you, and you grasp what the content of what I'm saying, there's only one conclusion to which you can come, or anybody can come, this is the one I, to which I have therefore also come, not only is there a God, there is a God because he has to be a God. Any rational creature, no matter what their religion is, whatever, you know, have they, if they have no religion at all, as long as they're a rational creature, they will necessarily come to this conclusion. Oh, so Anselm thinks. Secondly, Anselm does not appeal to any empirical evidence to prove God. Uh, there are others who do so. There, there is what's called the cosmological argument for the existence of God. You look at the evidence of nature, um, you see that it's complex, watch as a watchmaker, therefore nature must have a nature maker call that being God. Um, so Anselm doesn't argue this way, although others can and do. Um, he gives us the ontological argument that is simply think about God. And if you're a rational being, there's only one conclusion you can draw. So St. Anselm sits in his armchair, he consults his thoughts, he reaches a conclusion. Suppose St. Anselm was blindfolded. Well, it wouldn't matter. He'd reach the same conclusion. Jean-Paul Sartre also sits in his armchair, but he reaches a very different conclusion. Um, now, one could not sit in the armchair like St. Anselm does. One could get out the telescope like Archdeacon Paley does uh, for the cosmological argument and, uh, and say, I observe certain things in nature that tell me that, that there must be a God behind it all. And they reach the same conclusion from very different starting points, but there, there are some differences. Um, those of us who want to know something, whether we have the option basically of the telescope or the armchair, or later on in, in, the, in the intro course, at least we'll get into this as the question of rationalism uh, versus empiricism. Okay, now I would not want to suggest to you, because it would be false, that all philosophers are God obsessed. I simply pointed out these two kinds of arguments about God as a way of saying, look, what's possible within the realm of philosophy? Um, 
It would be a mistake, however, to conclude that uh, philosophers are God intoxicated. Um, most philosophers don't spend their time, most of their time thinking about religion. Religion is something very different from philosophy, although it can be the object of philosophy. But let's turn to another, um, another example of a different kind of argument that has nothing to do with God, but has to do with language. And this comes from John Austin, J.L. Austin. Where would you find him? Is he Greek? Is he medieval? Is he early modern? Is he modern? Well, you'll find him in the handout on page 14, actually. He just, just precedes the entry on Jean Paul Sartre. Born in 1911, died in 1960, so middle of the 20th century. Austin was a language philosopher and um, up at Oxford. Um, and uh, you'll gather as my course goes on that I'm rather a fan of Sir Karl Popper, um, who was an implacable enemy of, well, actually he was an implacable enemy of a number of things. He was, could get very agitated. But uh, among other things of, of language philosophy, particularly as it was practiced up at Oxford uh, during his day. Um, and uh, Popper famously says at one point, words don't matter. Hmm? Um, his friend Ernest Gellner uh, qualifies that a little bit. Uh, words and things, uh, thoughts matter, words don't. But, but, you know, Popper's point was, you know, you can spin your wheels, argue about definitions and get nowhere. What matters instead of words are problems. Yeah. That's Popper's major point. And I, I think Popper was onto something important there. But at the same time, of the people who did language philosophy, there were some really silly ones. There were some very serious ones. Austin, I think, is among the serious ones. Um, in an, an essay called How to Do Things with Words, that's a good title. it's a title of a collection of essays of his, How to Do Things with Words. He draws a distinction between two types of utterances, two, two kinds of speech acts. Um, what he calls constitutive and what he calls performative. Now, later on, he would add some more to this, uh, this taxonomy, but, but this is the basic taxonomy we work for us here. Constitutive utterances, performative utterances. What's the difference? Well, constitutive utterances, we use these all the time. Today is Thursday. I'm, actually, it happens to be Thursday, but uh, you know, fill in whatever day it happens to be for you, and that's a true constitutive utterance. Or, my shirt is uh, red and gray striped whatever. Um, okay, and th these kinds of utterances refer to something outside themselves. They e would either correspond or not correspond to states of affairs, facts of the matter outside of themselves, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a difference between language and acting there, but there are also what he calls performative utterances. Now, his example is a promise. If I say to you, I promise X, Y, and Z. I'm not just describing my promise, I am doing my promise by those words. So if I say to you, as I do to my classes, um, there are only two exams in this class and your grade is based on performance only. I'm making that promise by way of stating, I'm, I'm guaranteeing that condition by way of stating that condition. And so I'm doing an act when I talk, you know? And normally we, contrast acting with talking. Well, he sure talks a good fight. Be doers of the word and not just hearers only. You can talk the talk, Pilgrim, but can you walk the walk? However, with performative utterances, speaking is acting. You can do things with words. Hmm? Ah, now that's a really interesting. It's one of those things that, you know, once you hear it, you say, yeah, that's obvious. It was kind of hiding in plain sight, but you know, it wasn't until the middle 1950s that somebody, Austin, actually stated that in so many words. You know, sometimes things which are hiding in plain sight are really hard to see. Okay, so I hope from this talk you get some sense of the kinds of things that are possible with philosophy. Um, again, I give you a, um, a timeline so you can hang some of these names on it. Understand at least whether um, you're dealing with a Greek philosopher, medieval, early modern, or modern. And it would be fair, for example, on an exam to ask, okay, here's a list of philosophers uh, in chronological order. Um, let's maybe give you four lists. Which one of these is correct? Now, so if you find a list in which uh, Plato comes at the end of the list, being a Greek, that's probably not likely. If you find a list in which Ompolos South comes at the beginning before the Greek, probably not, you know. So that, that kind of level of, of, of general, I don't try to memorize the dates. I had to consult, you know, if you notice the handout, I, I don't, I couldn't tell you when exact dates when Lenny Descartes lived, 
don't have to you can always look it up but you know get at least a general sense of what period of time and also i think that will help you organize the whole plethora of names generally also uh, again on the final exam there'll be a little line up a little reward uh if you can name a philosopher name the idea and uh and describe the idea for one one three points total of five um now let me give you a couple warnings in closing this semester, uh, those of you who are taking this class as a class as opposed to watching it on YouTube, obviously, you can receive many PowerPoints. Um, well, you wouldn't have seen on YouTube, but I'm taking my word for it, my handwriting is crap. And so I learned early, no, not early, I learned some time ago to do PowerPoints because it's much more legible. And once the class is over, um, I then can take these PowerPoints and put them in PDF format, print them send them and through email and everybody has access to them. It's much more efficient than the old fashioned paper way of doing things. Plus you can zoom in, plus you could get color. Um, however, my PowerPoints are not standalones. I'm very firm about this and this is probably not the way most people use them. They're not substitutes for the readings, they're not substitutes for the lectures. So typically I do not send them until after we've done the lecture. <coughs> um, don't make the mistake of thinking that just because my PowerPoints are digital that this course is merely an online course. It's not. Uh, it requires everything a traditional course does. So readings, lectures are important. PowerPoints may help uh, behind the lecture and to, to reinforce the readings. Think of my teaching strategy like a three-legged stool. Okay, what happens if you lose one leg on a three-legged stool? Um, it becomes very unstable. And the last word of warning I'd like to um, call your attention to is on the front of the handout, um, caution, abstraction, handle with extreme care, maybe hazardous to clear thinking, the raft is not the shore. This is not a history of philosophy. Um, this is just a very potted account. This is not something I'd ever want to publish, for instance, as, as a serious scholarly work. But that doesn't mean that it's not useful as a handout. I hope that it is. Uh, again, for the two reasons that I mentioned. One, to give you a timeline in which to hang a lot of names. Secondly, to give you the occasion to adopt an idea. Find an idea, think about it throughout the course of the semester, use it, make it your own. And then, you know, if you do that, the reward on the end is, is kind of a freebie, you know, free five points on the final exam. Oh, and one more last thing uh, I do want to mention. If you turn to the last page of the handout, there are some suggestions for further reading. And um, all of these are good. They're, they're not required for the course, but, um, but still, um, still worth a look. Um, Paul Edwards' Encyclopedia of Philosophy, more than 50 years old now, still good. You know, philosophy doesn't change all that much. It's been around for 2,600 years. Um, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Online is something comparable to Edwards if you want to, to, to get it online. Bertie Russell wrote a long time ago, Problems of Philosophy is still worth reading as a basic introduction. Uh, his History of Western Philosophy is the, well, there are some newer ones that are, that, that give him some run for the money. But basically, if you want to do some further reading, um, those, those uh, are among uh, some of the key resources. Okay, so thank you and um, good luck and I will see you uh, in the uh, next lecture.